The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> you bow your heads with me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our hearts and speak to them. Take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I get one week off and I can't even remember my own prayer before the sermon. How's that go, huh? Um, <clears throat> well, good morning again. And to those of you who are visiting uh, the beginning of this season of Epiphany, the season of light, uh, as we remember that God came not only to save uh, the Jewish family, but also all of us, known as Gentiles. Um, and that is Epiphany, the light coming. But I want to hearken back real quickly to Christmas. You remember that? Two weeks ago, last year, it was a long time ago. Um, and I know many of you were here for that. And in that sermon, I really kind of hammered on this idea that we, and it wasn't meant to be a negative thing, are a species who needs a lot of help and salvation. And I spoke about that help and salvation in the context of assuming that God is helping us and saving us at the end, the big reveal for the Christmas message was, so we could join him in his work, in proclaiming his message and, and loving our neighbor. But right before I got to that missional call, I kind of skimmed over a couple things that you might want to remember, and maybe you thought, he didn't talk about those. And so what I first said was, God comes to help and save us because he loves us? Of course he does. Because he wants to heal us and make us whole? And I said, of course he does. And then I got to the, because he wants us to join us in his work. And I bet some of you were like, did he just skip the love part like it wasn't a big deal? The mission part is big, it's important. You hear it from me all the time. I like to remind people that part of the idea of us dismissing out the door is because we take what we have learned here, what the Spirit has taught us, and we go out to live it. That's the mission. And that's great, and it's important. But sometimes, especially at the beginning of a new year in the season of light, it's really nice to be reminded that God loves us, loves you, each one of you, loves me sometimes. Mostly. I don't know. He loves us. And it's important for us to remember that. Yes, his kingdom work gives us purpose. For those of you who, who think that you're wandering aimlessly, his work, the calling, gives us purpose. And being made whole and healing helps that work. But it is the love of God in Christ that binds together his healing work and fills us with the hope and the light to move forward in that darkness that lists outside of this world, outside of these walls. It is that love that we all seek. And the amazing thing, if you don't remember, and that's why we come on Sundays sometimes to be reminded, is that God's love and his healing and his purpose are offered to all people. If I had a whiteboard, I would capitalize and bold and underline all people are offered the healing love of God in Christ. Now, some of us don't admit we need any of that. Some of us, not maybe us, but maybe in the world, if you're here, you probably are okay with it, but there are people in the world we know who don't want to hear that. Some of us, at times, need a little bit more of the healing love than others. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to offer it to everyone to you and to me, despite everything else. And that is the grace of God. The thing that we often forget, I think, is that we need to come to him. We need to know him. We need to hear his word. We need to follow him. 
and we need to pray. This last week as I was working on my sermon, I came across rather wonderful little eight sentences from this poem book, one that I've never read and probably never will be, to be quite honest, because it's in Old English. Now, some of you may have been required to read this probably prior to 1980, and I'm not doing an ageism thing. I just, they don't do this anymore. So some of you know this. It's John Milton's Paradise Lost. And if you have to read that in high school or college, at least one of you, okay, two of you, three of you. I hate Old English. I was never a big fan of Shakespeare. Not that there's not beautiful poetry, but the language just eventually muddles my brain and I just want to read something else. But I came upon this last week in relation to the scripture in Isaiah and to the theme of my sermon, I thought, I gotta read it, it's beautiful. So bear with me, because I'm gonna read it with some of the old English, as best as I can. John Milton's Paradise Lost, a section from book one. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. Instruct me, for thou knowest Thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, saddest brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark illumine, what is low raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence, and justify the ways of God to men." Whether you like Old English or not, like me, it's still beautiful. And this is Milton praying, speaking to his God, to the Spirit of God who, who hovered like a dove, which we hear in reference today in the baptism of Jesus, the same dove, the Spirit of God, hovering over creation, and perhaps for our day and age, impregnating creation is not correct, but this was written in the 1600s. And then he says to that same spirit that created the universe and hovered over those waters, dove-like, he says, he cries out to that spirit, he says, what is in me that is dark, illumine. What is low, raise up and support. This is Milton crying out to God and saying, I need your light, I need your healing love. And he says, if I come into that pattern of healing love, I will then relieve, reveal to the world, to men, men and women, the providence of God. Come, Lord, show me. But it is those passages. What is, in, what is dark in me, illumine. What is low, raise up in support. That I found in contrast, an interesting contrast today with Isaiah 42. Because we hear something similar but different in the passage we hear in Isaiah today. These sentences, hear these words and these images. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not quench. This idea that we need that light, that he can't put it out. This idea that we are bruised and he will lift us up and support us. These images in Milton and Isaiah come together through the Christmas sermon and remind us that we do need that help and that salvation from our God. We need that healing. We need that love. And today I just want to tease out these two wonderful images. This bruised reed that he cannot break and this dimly burning wick that he will not quench. Now Isaiah is talking about the servant of God. There is the spirit descending. There is the work he's going to do. He will not break. If you are wondering, he is speaking of the Messiah, who we know as Jesus. And he brings forth this idea of a bruised reed, which is great for most of us because we live, I live partially on a marsh. Some of you do too. And imagine walking along the marsh line and those Stinky phragmites that have taken over all of New England. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you hate them. Anyway, any other grass, and you accidentally kind of hit one or lightly step on one. And what happens to that grass? It bends, right? Is it broken? No. It is bruised. Not broken, bruised. And that bruise, that metaphor, is relating to that which weighs us down the difficulties and the terribleness in life that come at us as if somebody had kicked you in the arm or the leg and that bruise is a reference to there was 
weight that went into that area of your body, whether it was the darkness or the pain or the loneliness or the oppression in your life, there's that bruise within our hearts and our souls and our being. But it's also a reference to the metaphor of the sins that we carry, the shame and the guilt, knowing those moments when we have wronged people, when we have done things that we know that God does not approve of. And we carry that weight like a bruise. It's almost like being lost, but not completely. Bruised, but not broken. And you see, God sees every one of us, you and I, as a bruised reed. And Christ comes like some magical marsh gardener, and he comes and he finds that bruised reed, and he gently, tenderly cares for it and brings it back to life unaffected by what comes around us. You hear the words following this in Isaiah today. You hear Isaiah say, he will not grow faint or be crushed. Jesus has work to do. He's unaffected by the darkness and the bruising and that which comes at us. He wades into the midst of it and says, I will heal you, I will love you. An image for me this last week came up, movie reference. For those of you who are new, I quote movies probably more often than I should. Saving Private Ryan, which is one of the greatest war movies ever made, probably not great for church families, but it is amazing historically. The first five minutes are the craziest opening military movie ever made. It's D-Day. They're landing at Normandy. All the craziness that you've heard of and you can imagine is happening. And there are men bleeding and dying and screaming on the beach. And in the midst of that crazy darkness, there's an army chaplain moving around as if he doesn't see or hear any of it. He's going to each person in his way and blessing them in the name of God. And you can see his face in the movie. This guy must have been amazing. Unperturbed by the death and destruction. I see Jesus in that every time I watch it. He comes into the midst of this craziness and he says, I'm going to heal you and love you no matter what is going on. I will not stop. I will not faint. I will not be crushed. We are the bruised reeds, and God comes to heal us with his love. The dimly burning wick, this other beautiful image. Those of you who ever held a, 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 a little candle or a little match, right before it goes out, you know, you're like, oh, don't go out, don't go out. Maybe not. We have flashlights on our phone, so it doesn't happen very often. But that image is quite the opposite, actually, of the first. The first is the weight of the world, the weight of sin bruising us. We need that healing. We need that forgiveness. We need that love in the midst of the shame and the guilt. That dimly burning wick is the opposite. It is the beginning of something divine. It is that spark within us created in the image of God. It is a small burning flame that waits to be turned into a burning and raging fire. And who comes to do that? Jesus. Many of us on most given days are good people. Don't tell yourself you are. That's called pride. But most of us think we're pretty good people, and generally we are. Most of us lead decent lives. And yet we are still a dimly burning light. There is always room to grow. And God sent Christ to flame those passions of love and passions for grace so that each one of us can get better and better in the likeness of Christ. There are many in this room, I don't know names, but I'm going to assume because all of us at some point have felt this. I am a Christian, I say. I believe in Jesus, I say. And yet there is no fruit. There is no passion of healing or love or grace. It is words that tremble out of our mouths. And God says, there are many on this planet who claim my son's name, and yet there is no flame that is burning. It is a dimly burning wick. And God says, I will send the one who will flame those passions. I will send him to bring the light so that you will become the light. You ever notice when a fire gets really low, especially, you know, kind of a, a burning fire out in the backyard, why is it low? Because it's run out of wood. It's run out of a source. 
This is those of us who have the small burning wick. Those of us who have known Jesus but not lived into Jesus. To get that fire raging, an inferno, a passion for the life of God, you must draw closer to the source. And so Christ has come and he waits and says, come unto me. I will fan that flame. I will fan that flame. And he will do it. Because he will not be affected. He will not faint. He will not be crushed. You cannot stop God from healing you or loving you. You can turn your backs on him and walk away. How do we know this? Today we hear it in two variations. We hear it in Isaiah that I have sent my righteousness upon him. And we hear it in Matthew when John the Baptist is like, I have to baptize you? What? And Jesus says what? This will be done to fulfill all righteousness. Now on one level what he's saying is, look, if you read Isaiah, which we just did, if you read Psalm 2, the prophets have been speaking that I would come, that I would do this, and doing this, being baptized by the Spirit, the dove-like coming to be upon me, the power of God resting in Christ, is prophesied. So fulfilling all righteousness is fulfilling Scripture. So let's do it. Isaiah said it was going to happen. Psalm 2 says it's going to happen. We're going to do it. But Scripture is the Word of God, and the Word of God is really the manifestation in this aspect of life written down of God's actual being, His will, who He is. This last week I came upon these two very interesting theological definitions, so bear with me, of what this righteousness means. And hear this. I'm going to tease this out. One definition of this righteousness that is fulfilled, this righteousness of the being of God, this righteousness is the strictness with which the, he acts, God acts, in accordance with the will of his holiness. I know it sounds a little, did you go to seminary? Yes, but still. This will is what? This is the will of love for those who are faithful. So his righteousness is doing for those of us who believe and follow him what he has to do because of who he is. I'll get it out. I'll tease it out. Hold on. The second one. This righteousness is the action of God in accordance with his purposes of love and the plan of salvation. Do you hear that? Remember? What is his plan to save us? Why? So that we can join his work. Yes, I'm going to do it reverse this time. Join in his work so that we can be healed and made whole. But why does he really do it? Why the cross? Why the prophets? Why the, 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 the whole nation of Israel and the story of the Bible? Because God loves us. John says God is love. And because by definition his being is love, the righteousness of God is him doing what he can't not do. Did you hear me? He can't not love you. He can't not heal you. He can't not seek you to save you and help you. You can say no, but he can't stop because it's literally who God is. And he goes to the most extreme measure to show you how much he loves you. By sending his son to die on the cross, to come as the embodiment, the manifestation, the incarnation of that love to show you what God's love really is and what it means for you. And Peter preached on it in Acts 2,000 years ago. We read that today. I'm reminding you again today. And the only hope, the only reminder is that we don't forget to hear him, to see him, to know him, to follow him, to pray to him. If the fire is going out, Draw closer to the source of the fire. Let us, this coming year, be like Milton, who cried out to the Spirit of God, to God himself, and said, what is dark in me illumine, what is low raise and support. And may each one of you today hear and know from my voice through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is waiting to answer you. He is waiting to respond to you through his love 
and his presence and his spirit because he cannot break the bruised reed and because he cannot quench the burnly dimming wick. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.